This is Star Talk, Cosmic Queries Edition. We could not resist the Nobel Prizes in Physics are related to black holes. Mm. Chuck, yes. we're devoting this entire Cosmic Queries to black holes as manifested in the recently announced Nobel Prizes in Physics. And the cool thing about it is no one will ever be able to see or hear this video because it won't be able to escape our black hole. Oh, is that right? I yeah. didn't know that all of our shows are in black holes. <laughs> <laughs> no, Let just me know this. One. this. Just this one. <laughs> I know a little bit about black holes, but not as much as our guest, a recurring guest, Jana Levin. Yay. Jana, welcome back to Star Talk. Thank you. It's always good to be here. Wherever and, here and, and, is, wherever here is now. I know, but for you, you kind of look like you're in a safe house. I know. Are I, you, I sort of so, am. I'm yeah, are, are, is the, are you in an identity protection program or something? What are you? <laughs> I'm at Pioneer Works, which is, you know, a cultural center in Brooklyn where I'm yeah. director of sciences. But I tell you, if the apocalypse is happening, this is where I'm coming. We've got oh, all okay. the resources you need. <laughs> wait, wait, Chuck, did you hear that? I'm, she said, uh, she if just, the apocalypse is coming, that's where she'll be, she, and that's where she is now. Right, exactly. And you're, you're invited. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so wait, tell me what happens at Pioneer Works. So we, uh, this, this place really started as, as inspiration of Dustin Yellen and Gabriel Florence as an art center, but with a vision of just impacting culture in creative ways, really kind of breaking down boundaries, doing things in a new way. And, um, and, and when I came in, we started bringing sciences in here, and we've been doing a lot of um, pretty incredible science events, not least interviewing Sir Roger Penrose last December. Oh, my God. Oh, my so God. You, that's so why he got the Nobel Prize. This. That's <laughs> right. why he got the Nobel Prize, because you interviewed him. <laughs> I just, like, said, rubbed my good karma on him. <laughs> <laughs> so, so tell me, uh, so the, uh, I, I know two of the three Nobel Prize winners Maybe all three. So there's Roger Penrose, yeah. mm -hmm. a, a well-known uh, physicist from Oxford, I think, in, mm -hmm. um, yep. in the UK. Um, we have, uh, who else was on that list? Andrea Gez. Uh, Andrea Gez. And mm -hmm. is she the, still in the University of California? Yeah, system? UCLA. UC, UCLA. Yeah. UCLA. Mm -hmm. So, And we had um, Gensler. Reinhard Gensel, yeah. Rhino Genzel. Yeah. And so these are, so they all split the Nobel Prize, all for their work in black holes. So if you can yeah. just give us sort of the, 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 the short version of each of their contribution to our understanding of black holes. Well, technically, Roger got half the prize. And really? Andrea oh. and Reinhardt split the other half. So now, and when you say got half the prize, are we talking half about the, the money. cold hard half cash? Half the money. Half the money. Wow. <laughs> half the, they each get, they each get, they don't get a half a medal. All right. They all, each they get all the get same a medal. medal. But when it's a half, they mean half the money. Yeah, well, yeah. you can, let me tell you something. You can keep your stinking metal. <laughs> How much you half the money? I want that check. <laughs> so right. it is, it's a super interesting prize because that's happened before that where they've divided the prize unequally amongst the three participants. And you can never have more than three winners of the Nobel Prize. Right. Um, so it, is, uh, it, it, it does reflect the fact that Andrea and Reinhardt, their work is observational and they are, they're both responsible independently for um, understanding supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy. So that's why they shared in the prize because they, they both contributed to that particular aspect of the award. Roger Penrose was just off on his own in like 1964. He's and been off on forever. He's been doing, he's on <laughs> right. his own thing. Yeah. Right. So that was all Roger. And he um, is very theoretical. So I'd say one of the most surprising things about this award was that people as theoretical as Roger Penrose, for example, Stephen Hawking, don't usually get awarded the Nobel Prize. And, um, and so this was considered, I think a lot of people were, were kind of chilled and delighted to see Sir Roger um, honored in this way. But it could be that the trend is not so much that they don't give it to theorists, but if they're gonna give it to theorists, mm -hmm. at, in the same breath, they're gonna give it to the experimentalist mm -hmm. who verified what the theorists said. Is mm -hmm. that yes. a fair way to characterize this? That is a this? fair way to characterize it. Um, but there's still a long stretch between like Roger's theory and the observations. Mm. So if you wanna talk about Roger's- well, I, I, Wait, yeah. as was true with the Higgs boson. Mm. That's right. That's so right. they gave it to to Peter Higgs. Higgs himself. Mm -hmm. a, 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 yeah, but he'd come up with that decades ago. Yeah. Whereas yeah. the fresh discovery of the Higgs boson was recent, in recent news. But they stapled yeah. them together and then they yeah. give them the award. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. I mean, 
Higgs, Higgs's prediction was so very specific, though. He literally predicted there would be this one particle, it would be roughly around this mass, and it would have these particular properties. I mean, it is a pretty spot-on prediction, whereas mm-hmm. Roger just sort of was dreaming big dreams. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> uh, not to put Higgs down in any way, but, you know, there was a less specificity. And even when Einstein got the Nobel Prize, he got it for very specific things. He did not get the Nobel Prize for general relativity. Well, uh-huh. which was clearly his greatest achievement. He got mm-hmm. it from more specific statements and more speci- specific predictions. So maybe the Nobel Committee is coming along. Yeah, maybe it's coming along. But, yeah. um, but Roger did do something tremendous, which was to make generic the prediction that black holes would be the end state of the collapse of a star. And uh, he was able to show that essentially singularities, which we thought were this may be an artifact of very special circumstances and wouldn't really happen if you thought more generally about things. He was able to prove that, in fact, it was a generic prediction of general relativity that a collapsing star would create behind it an event horizon and interior it would create a singularity, essentially. Wow. So it's right after Einstein first thinks of general relativity that Schwarzschild writes to him from the Russian front and discovers this thing that we now call a black hole. But it's Russian very, front in the First World War. In the First World War. It's 1916, mm-hmm. and he's mm-hmm. on the Russian front, and he's saying, you know, you, the, world, the, war, the war has treated me kindly enough, and I've been able to wander through the land of your ideas. And so here he solves this problem, and it's very idealized. It's a complete sphere. It's perfectly collapsed. He doesn't ask how or why. He just idealizes a situation, and he comes up with this thing that we now call a black hole. And so for decades after that, people thought, well, that's just a silly, idealized situation. It's not wrong. It's correct mathematically, but that'll never happen in nature. What Roger Penrose does in 1964 is he uses the most ingenious methods in a paper about three pages long, In the final paragraph of this incredibly clear, lucid, simple paper, he proves that, in fact, it is absolutely generic prediction of general relativity that a collapsing body would create behind it an event horizon and inside a singularity. So he makes black holes inevitable. He made them real. He He made them real. Made them real. (laughs) Wow. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, so they go from this mathematical, perfect, silly, platonic idealization to an inevitable reality. So and on, now on the other side of that uh, Nobel Prize coin, we have two mm-hmm. people, independent researchers, who are figuring out that our galaxy has a supermassive black hole in the middle. But of course, you can't see black holes. So what light can you shed on <laughs> on their discoveries? Ah, uh, see, see, you, you see what I did there? I was see that what good? you did there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you punster, you punster. Mm-hmm. So they did. They they demonstrated the opposite characteristics as 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 powerful scientists slow and methodical. (laughs) They looked at these stars for decades, right? Two decades. And they watched these stars orbit um, an invisible object. And just, they don't even need to At the center of the galaxy. At the center of the galaxy. It's 26,000 light years away in the direction of the constellation Sagittarius. So we call the object that they orbit Sag A star, Sagittarius A star, because only because it's in that direction from our point of view. It's a cute little nickname. So around Sag A star, they see some stars orbiting, and they can follow their entire orbits. Take some, one of them takes about 16, 17 years. Um, that, that's kind of the one that uh, was most helpful to them. Well, just to be clear, normally when we think of things orbiting other things, we think of planets orbiting stars. stars. Yeah. Now you're talking about stars orbiting other things. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly, right, exactly. Mm-hmm. So now you have a bunch of stars in the center of the galaxy, a bunch that are orbiting this thing. Now you can't see this thing. It's definitely dark and it's very massive. And contrary, I think, to sort of the popular imagination about black holes, black holes aren't huge. The whole point of black holes is that they're tiny. Right. So for how heavy they are, they're tiny. So this object, they just look at the orbit and deduce, wow, that thing is four million times the mass of the sun but it's fitting in a region much smaller than the solar system. Not four million times the size of the sun, right? It's, if you calculate how big you think it should be, it's about 17 times the width of the sun across, but four million, four million times, times its times mass. mass. That's, That's right. crazy. 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 So, they, so they go, look, it's really heavy, it's really small, it's a supermassive black hole. Wow. Okay. Yeah. 
Well, exactly. there you have it. And by the way, this is our second or third hour, the astrophysics community, mm -hmm. our second or third Nobel Prize in a decade. Generally, they used yeah. to throw us a bone once Wait, in every 10 years. I, are you saying that you guys are the Meryl Streep? Of the Nobel Prize? <laughs> no, 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 I'm saying. <laughs> oh, wait. <no. laughs> Black uh, holes are. <laughs> well, the, the, the prize is in the category of physics, just to be clear. Right. So we in my community, we're not living our lives wondering if we'll be considered. Mm -hmm. Occasionally, yeah. we do something that touches on laws of physics, and, mm -hmm. and then it gets, and, and people take a note. We, ju we just got it for exoplanets, which is yeah. not itself That's a right. new branch of, of physics, but it's a very mm -hmm. interesting uh, advance in our understanding of the world mm -hmm. and uh, or the universe. Mm -hmm. So I'm just saying, maybe the, the we're done with laboratories on Earth, and the best laboratories on the frontier of discovery are the universe itself. Well, it's it's fascinating because Hubble lobbied for astrophysics to be considered by the physics Nobel oh, wait, Prize. Hubble, the man. Edwin Hubble, the man, mm -hmm. not, not the telescope. The, yes. the telescope, right, is not live. Right? The telescope <laughs> remains. Not lobbying. That'd be cool. That'd be <laughs> awesome. Mm -hmm. It remains inanimate. Yeah. Yes, it remains. It's still, it's still to this day, <laughs> not alive. <laughs> right. Okay. But Hubble, really, you know, so what did Hubble do that was so tremendous? Today, Hubble abs absolutely, un unquestionably, would have won the Nobel Prize. So what he did Hubble two, do? Two Nobel Prizes. Right. So for one. In the same decade, yes. Yeah. He realizes that there are other galaxies. You have to realize when Einstein was working in 1905 and 1915, 1916, he did not know that there was another galaxy besides the Milky Way. He suspected, but he wasn't sure, right? So Hubble observes the first external galaxies. But just to be clear, at that time, the universe was just the stars of the night sky. Yeah. And how wow. far do they extend, nobody knows. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. And then the second thing, which I'm sure I'm, I'm, I'm guessing Neil's referring to, is he then also notices that, oh, by the way, all those galaxies are moving away from each other. Right. And, and so he deduces that the universe is expanding. So, right. cool. so, he, so he lobbied, so he, so he lobbied the Nobel Committee, and then what they say? I guess they said no. I guess, well, yeah, I don't know if there were like formal letters exchanged, but uh -huh. there was certainly political, you know, there was internal politics, and they said no for what month's that? Nineteen twenties? They said no for another fifty years. I don't think it was until the seventies that the Nobel Prize Committee considered astrophysics. Yeah, I think the first one was maybe the discovery of pulsars. Yeah. And that was the 1970s on a discovery made in the 60s. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. 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 Cool. Yeah. Well, actually, we got to take a break now. But Chuck, did you load up questions? Because this I, is a Cosmic Queries. I got them all loaded up and ready to go. And there are pages of them. People, people love black holes. <laughs> all right. When we come back more with our friend Jan 11 to get us through an understanding of black holes on Star Talk. We're back, Star Talk, Cosmic Queries, Black Hole Edition. Actually, Chuck, we've had other Black Hole editions of Cosmic Queries, but yes. this time Black Hole's done one, upped and won Nobel Prizes. Yes. In fact, it's not the first time Black Holes have won Nobel Prizes. Right. And last time we did that, we had to bring in Jan 11 to explain what the hell was going on, and we're doing that again today. Sweet. In this <laughs> second segment of Cosmic <laughs> Queries. Jana, always great to have you back in the loop. Thank you so much, I always love being here. What's, one of the times we brought you in was because of the LIGO discovery of colliding black holes. Right. And yeah. they got a Nobel Prize. Yeah. Okay. So black holes, that, so the Nobel Committee is liking them some, no, some, some black holes lately. Yeah, definitely. I think there's probably another one in the near future. Uh-oh. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't want to, you know... I don't want to, I don't know, jinx don't anybody. Jinx them, but don't keep us in suspense either. <laughs> well, I think we should talk about LIGO, but I think Event Horizon Telescope, which took that image of the black hole at the center of M87, which is a galaxy 55 million light years away, um, and they imaged as close to the event horizon as is essentially conceivable given right. the realities of where right. we the live resolution was there yes that's right mm -hmm. yeah it's so, very, so it's, for it's taking possible. that photo the photo mm -hmm. of a black hole okay it's conceivable yeah, so even so it's interesting if you look at the nobel prize announcement for this prize they say about roger penrose for his contribution to understanding black holes and they explicitly say that but for angioges and genzel when they're talking about the supermassive black hole they don't name it they say for their discoveries of a compact object at the center of the oh. galaxy. <laughs> what? They won't call it a black hole. They won't call it a black hole. Oh. Yo, let me just say, that's racist. <laughs> that's, <laughs> Chuck. 
Yo, that's some racist stuff I ever heard. All right? That's all I'm saying. <laughs> you, you are that crazy. Right. That ain't right. <laughs> <laughs> if anything has a tinge of it, Chuck is all up in it. He's going to be he's gonna call it out. Okay, thank you, Chuck, for calling out the racist ways of the Nobel Prize well, Committee. Well, the interesting reason why I suspect they did that is because, as, so they're looking at these orbits of these stars, right, around this dark object that we know is really heavy and really small, and by rights we should call a black hole. But it only com- it doesn't come near the event horizon. It doesn't okay. come all the way close. So it, I think the closest approach of the star is about a few times as close as Neptune comes to the sun. Um, okay. And that's very, very close when you're talking about an object uh, four million times the mass of the sun. But if it's only 17 times as wide, it's right. not that close. Mm-hmm. Right. You know gotcha. what I mean? Right. Right. Whereas a Van Horizon telescope is seeing stuff like right on it. Okay, so Chuck, <laughs> if they gave it to the Event Horizon Telescope and still didn't call it a black hole, then right. you'll have the then, then I got a cl- then I got a case, right? Then you I, got a case. Got a we'll case. take that to the now Supreme we got a case. Court. We're gonna take that. <laughs> okay, cool. Uh, right, oh, by cool. the way, one thing about the Event Horizon Telescope image: uh, first of all, a zillion people participated in that, so they probably have to give the Nobel Prize organizationally. That's uh, a really I, I interesting, bet. yeah, question. Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's, a, it's a reminder that today consortia. Yeah make discoveries more so than individuals. Yeah. For LIGO, they gave it to three individuals. And well, that they were at it long. Be- they've been, they were right. at it long before LIGO was even LIGO. Exactly. They were at yeah. it for, for, for 30, 40 years right, right. before other people joined. And so that was different. But some people also argue that it should be given a Nobel Peace Prize because here you have an international consortium that transcends you know, all these nationalities, all of these political borders, all of these languages, all of these cultural differences and come together and then give the work freely, then the work is free. They don't even mm-hmm. monetize it. Right, um, right. So that's an interesting argument. It's a form of peace, that's exactly right. So, and so, a form of peace that scientists have known ever mm-hmm. since the beginning, mm-hmm. as collaborations take us international. Yeah. Uh, I, I, a quick Event Horizon photo story before we get to Chuck's question. Mm-hmm. So I use the Event Horizon photo uh, mm-hmm. for a tweet. Can I, can I tell you what that tweet was? <laughs> it was, okay. So scientists, colon, mm-hmm. we've, Imaged a black hole in a galaxy in the nucleus of a galaxy 55 uh, million light years away. That's science. Mm-hmm. Public. Ooh. <laughs> uh, scientists. Uh, humans are causing global warming. Public. I don't, that doesn't agree with my philosophy. I don't agree with that. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> How did that That's go down? How did I that just, go I, down? I, I, uh, it was, you know, people. It's it's social media, so it yeah. goes every, media. every which way. But every which yeah. way it can. But the irony wasn't lost on most people. So that's, funny. that's brilliant. That's a brilliant tweet. And, yeah. So, uh, and so Chuck, so give all it right, to me. Let's get what to it. Have? Okay. So uh, actually, we're going to start with a uh, Patreon uh, question from uh, my son because I actually am on Patreon, so he gets to ask. Uh, at which is, uh, can black holes tell us anything about? the age of nearby stars or stars that are orbiting them. Interesting. Am I trying it or are you trying it, Neil? I'll try, and if I miss anything, you yeah, jump in. Yeah, because I think there's a lot of dimensions to the answer. Well, so a, a black hole as the endpoint of a star, of, uh-huh. of a dead star, that star didn't live very long. You know, maybe half a million years, tops. Okay. So if you see a black hole, if it's freshly made, then the thing that made the black hole itself was not all that old. Half a million is not long in the history of the universe. Not at all. So black holes are the product of very high mass stars that have very short lives. And, but once you make the black hole, it's there, right? So you'd have to have seen the black hole get made to then know how young it is. But if the black hole is just hanging out, um, I don't know that you can know how old it is just by observing. I, 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 now, now, we know there's an upper limit to how massive a black hole can get as the endpoint of a dying star. But if you find a black hole that's much more massive than that, then stuff happened after that. Or some other phenomenon went on that would have kept accumulating, kept eating. And as it eats, mm-hmm. it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So I don't know that you can know precisely the age of a black hole, but you can get a sense of how long a black hole has been, been in town. Yeah, I, I, I'm going to agree with Neil. I'm going to say even more so, one of the big mysteries about the supermassive black holes that were acknowledged 
although not by name, mm -hmm. in this year's Nobel Prize, was that they're so big. And we definitely know those do not form as the end state of stellar collapse. Something had to happen to make that thing so big. So either it formed in the early universe, and this is something that's really odd. The bigger the black hole, the less dense the material you need to make it. It's very surprising. So you could make a really big black hole out of the density of air under the right conditions, which really surprises people. But if you make it from a star, it's got to be incredibly dense. So it could be that it was made in the early universe and not from stars at all. Or it could be that it started as a smaller black hole and then went through a bunch of collisions and, and got bigger and collected other black holes and just amassed and amassed and amassed until it was a supermassive black hole at the center of the galaxy. And that requires a lot of time and a lot yeah. of collisions. And just to, just to round this out, currently none of us in, a, in my field doubt the likelihood that every single large galaxy has a supermassive black hole in its core. Hmm. Um, initially, it was hypothesized, and then we had some early Hubble data, and then some other data, and then it was like, you know, this looks pretty um, endemic to what mm -hmm. it is to be a galaxy at all. And if you have mm -hmm. colliding galaxies that merge, uh, you'd expect the black holes to ultimately merge in the middle. So mm -hmm. I got you on that one. But also, yeah. um, it's still, I don't know, I'm not the, I haven't seen the latest in this, but when I last looked, there was still some uncertainty about whether the black hole nucleated the formation of a galaxy or whether the galaxy had mechanisms that funneled material to the center right. to then make the galaxy. Because even if you have a billion solar mass black hole, which some galaxies do in their center, mm -hmm. that is a tiny, it's less than one-tenth of one percent of the mass of the whole galaxy. Mm -hmm. So as ferocious as that sounds, the total galaxy wins if, you wanna, if you're on a balancing scale. Absolutely. Skin. So you yeah. might have thought you know, oh, even if it's true that all of these galaxies have these supermassive black holes, they're such a small percentage in terms of the mass, they're probably not influential on the galaxy. Who cares? Right. But it actually turns out that's not the case because they can blow these gigantic winds. They could have been very active in their early history and been like quasars. They could have right. sculpted the entire galaxy. They could have regulated the size, the shape, the number of like the, of stars that form. So they, they might actually have incredible agency despite their smaller fraction in terms of mass. And, it, and, and, and is that because in the formation of the black hole that it is spewing out materials in order for it to become what it becomes? Yeah, in the yeah, in the early days it was reeking, it was blowing out these jets, you know, and it was just it was like imagine these winds. There are there are black holes whose jets are so strong that they're puncturing neighboring galaxies and basically wiping out any planetary life in those galaxies. Right. So they have they <laughs> have you actually just get into a fight. That's all. You, you, yeah. You're not understanding the dynamics of this. <laughs> so the Nobel for exoplanets is in a fight for the Nobel for the supermassive black hole. But the hole. point is, you only get to see all this if the if there's material material in the vicinity of a black hole for it to do that to. Right. If a black mm -hmm. hole completely ate everything in its vicinity, then there's all these mechanisms shut off. Right. There was nothing to see, right. Wow, mm -hmm. God, right. that's so cool. All right, mm -hmm. well. All right, they keep it coming, Chuck. Here we go, this is Liam Pendergrass, also from uh, Patreon. What opportunities for future research uh, into black holes are created as a result of this particular prize being awarded? So is there, is there anything new that came out of this that may spur uh, further discovery? Well, let me lead something here and then I'm gonna hand off to Jana. Because the Nobel Prize is essentially always delayed from the discovery itself, it's not clear whether the prize itself is stimulating more research because the original research already did that. Right, so the original search was already in, we already knew it was important. We already, and the, the best kind of prize is the one that, that affirms what you already knew. And in this case, this, we are, like Janice said, we knew Roger Penrose was brilliant. We knew he had influential papers. We knew the, the, the supermassive black holes in the centers of galaxies. That's a long standing project. So that did trigger other interesting projects. Let's look at other galaxies to see if they have um, supermassive black holes with the next most pow powerful telescope. But Janet, do you think the act of getting a prize itself changes any of that landscape? Um, gosh, I, 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 I think I'm with you. I don't think the act of getting the prize does. I think it might affect generations that are just on the rise. Like, you know, your son, Chuck, 
asked a question inspired because we were talking about the Nobel Prize. And who knows, maybe that's going to affect your son's interest ultimately point. in science. I mean, for the scientists who are practicing now, I would say no, not so much. But, but it does have that effect, I think, for the younger generation. Excellent um, point, because and, it's, and it's black holes are in the news now for a whole other reason. Yeah. And that that, that you're, there's a celebration with a big fat check. <laughs> That's yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> in America, and, money talks. That's what yeah. it is. <laughs> well, and I'm glad to hear you say that because uh, that's for his research club. Black holes are his, uh, are his focus. So uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to I'm gonna ask you to talk to him. <laughs> <laughs> well, and by the way, kids gonna, love black holes. I don't care. We're totally cheating. Screw that them other so kids. That's so cute. Screw that them other so kids. Cute. I'll be like, my son has Neil deGrasse Tyson and Jan 11. I don't give a damn. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, kids. Sorry. <laughs> That's how the cookies crumble. <laughs> That's how the cookies crumble. What can we say? <laughs> totally. Wait, wait. So, but it, make an interesting point, Jana, that if it's another reason to talk about something in the mm -hmm. context of it be, having been a celebrated result mm -hmm. rather than just a highly respected result that definitely adds a societal force on this. I, I, I agree with you there mm -hmm. entirely. And it's interesting that a lot of these Nobel Prizes are connected. So for instance, the supermassive black hole at the center of the galaxy also has littler black holes orbiting it. And, right. and they did form from the end state of gravitational collapse. Now littler might be 30, 60 times the mass of the sun. And so LIGO, which is the experiment that you mentioned earlier, Neil, that got the Nobel Prize, what was it, to 2016, 2017? Um, 2017, that they're detecting the collision of two black holes that are more around 50, 60 times the mass of the sun each. And they might be doing that near a supermassive black hole. And so these are all connected discoveries. And, um, and so some of the ones that, that LIGO is beginning to and I don't want to say observe, but really listen to, because LIGO doesn't take pictures. LIGO listens to the resonance of space around these like orbiting mallets. We're starting to think that maybe those in fact really are coming from galactic centers. Wow. So, um, so there could be 20,000, 40,000 black holes around the center of our own galaxy that are just smaller ones. Wow. All right, That's Chuck, we blew that well, whole segment. Well, all I can say to that is, there goes the neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> Black holes coming in. Ah, and the they're gathering gonna becoming destroy, bigger. <laughs> they're going to destroy your neighborhood. I'm letting you know this. <laughs> and they get together. Holes and they get coming bigger. In. And they get bigger. So, Chuck, we just blew that whole segment on your son's question. I just oh, well. Totally worth it. <laughs> okay, so when we come back, we're picking up Star <coughs> Cosmic Queries with Jan 11. We're talking about Black Holes when we return. We're back. Star Talk Cosmic Queries. Chuck Nice with me always. Always a pleasure. And and you're tweeting at Chuck Nice Comic. Thank you. Yes, I am, sir. Thank and we're talking black holes today, so of course that means Jan Eleven is in the house. <laughs> and, and Jana, you're tweeting at what? Jan Eleven. At Jan Eleven, and that's a Jana with two ends. We got you. Yep. Yeah, all right. I, I like an extra consonant, you know, just in case I lose one, in case one drops off. Exactly. Jan 11 has three N's in it, just to let the record show. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, what is it, 40% of the letters in your name? <laughs> uh, so with, this is Cosmic Queries. So Chuck, keep keep coming at us with these questions. All right, I'm staying with... And this one is from your wife now, right? You're the whole family. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That, All right, go. That'll be a fun. Go. <laughs> so this one is from Grandma uh, Eugenio Barno. This is Eugenio <laughs> Barrera. Says, hey, Chuck, Neil, Jana, how are you? After years of following you guys on YouTube, I finally pulled the trigger on being a Patreon, and I'm glad I did because now I get my question read. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Yeah. And he says, uh, <clears throat> I was wondering if black holes have the gravi gravitational pull to affect light, does it also alter its speed? Ooh. So it bends light, does it slow it down when it bends it? Ooh. So interesting. Interesting question. Neil, what do you think? Want to try this one? I would just say no. Okay, next question. <laughs> <laughs> but there's a really subtle example that I think illustrates how bizarre it is. Okay, yeah, right, go the for event, it. So because the event horizon is, by definition, the place at which light cannot escape, you could ask, well, what happens to light at the event horizon then if it can't escape? 
And so you could just drop a little beam of light, a little bundle of light, and uh, let's call it a photon, and it would sit there at the event horizon. It would not move. It's actually a completely state, not stable, unstable, but a place where it can be. However, you can't sit there and not move. So if you're falling across the black hole event horizon and you fall past that little piece of light, you go, oh, it's moving at the speed of light. <laughs> wow. But uh, nobody can say it's not because nobody could stay there with it because you'd have to be traveling at the speed of light to stay there with it. So when Chuck, you fall Chuck, into this the event horizon, Jana it looks in Wonderland. to you. Janet in Wonderland. <laughs> that, let me not tell you Alice in Wonderland. Janet in Wonderland. That okay. is... <laughs> That is a rabbit black hole if I ever heard <laughs> keep one, Keep going, man. keep going, Janet, keep going. Well, the other way to think about it is it's like a salmon swimming up, up the Niagara, <laughs> like swimming upstream, and the waterfall of space-time is just falling in so rapidly that it effectively stands still. Right. But nobody can stand still with it. Everybody else is going with the waterfall. Right, right, So everyone right. else, if they try to measure the speed of light, it's like, oh, yeah, it's traveling at the speed of light. It's nearly 300,000 kilometers a second. Nobody says it's standing still. Right. But technically, it's sitting right there at the event horizon. That's but it's still so trying to get out. It's still it's trying, trying to get out. It's right. trying like hell to get out. Okay. But it, oh, that it's is trying so Trying like hell to get out. Yeah. So what, what's the observation outside of the black hole? What are we seeing? Is it just you, sitting you there? You just never see that photon because it never gets to you. When you say, what do I see? The only way you see something is if the light hits your eye. Right. So, so but if you can't it's stuck do it there, because it's stuck there. So you oh, don't see it. Oh, my God. That, so it's dark. So, yes. And Red Horizon's dark. It's a black hole. That's crazy. Wait, yeah. wait, that's, and, and another, just to, just to add another point there. Right. Wow. You will only see that photon if that photon enters your eye. Right. So mm -hmm. therefore, you have no idea it's even there. This was my issue with the with Star Trek, right? They have these <laughs> phasers that uh, no the the um, phasers right when it shoots lasers at another ship, okay, yeah, those in the vacuum are, yeah. of space. Those are, those are phasers, yeah. And then so, and then they have photon torpedoes. And photon torpedoes. So yeah. they're sending this in a direction towards the ship, but the the camera view is from the side. So, uh -huh, but you see this like you see it. But no, no, it's right. sending this energy to the ship. There's no way right. you would see that laser going to the ship. Right. There's just no way, wow. uh, unless it's sending light in your direction, but that that wouldn't right. be an efficient weapon. Or so I, like I you make, issues. yeah, or you make like a gas cloud and it scatters. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So you <laughs> can like, make like a fog chamber. You no, have no, to, no, you, you have to have you, a fog you, machine. You hit the, the the chalkboard erasers together. And then you make <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, Chuck, give me some more. All right, and, and okay. we, we now know Jana is a cousin of Alice in Wonderland. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, this is from Biz Biz Bizivi. Cool. We'll go with uh, that. <laughs> I, I'm going to go with it. I'm going with that. Uh, says, what did Roger Pendrose do that wasn't already done by Einstein and Schwarzschild before? A mm -hmm. little bit of a hater here. A little bit mm -hmm. of a hater. So I think, yeah. Jenna, you, you hinted to some of that. Yeah. But why was an Einstein solution yeah. or the Schwarzschild solution inevitable? What is the different thing that that Penrose did to make mm -hmm. it a natural end state? Mm -hmm. Well, so in the simplest terms, he was able to show that generically, without assuming any special properties, like something's a perfect sphere. It could have been a, an oblong, kidney-shaped eggplant thing, doesn't matter. If it collapses, he was able to prove it would inevitably form that event horizon, and within that event horizon, inevitably would be the singularity. And one way to think about this, which I think is really profound, is he was able to show that all paths of light, and this is technically one of the ways that he did it, point towards the singularity. Technically, what that means is that the singularity is in the future. We look at a black hole, we think of a spherical thing with a center point that's this point singularity in space. What Roger wow. Penrose showed is the singularity is not in space, it's in the future, once you're inside that black hole. And so nobody who enters the black hole can do anything but plunge into that singularity. You can no more avoid the singularity than you can avoid the next moment in time. Okay, so, wow. <laughs> well, that's, okay. Like I said, that, Alice in Wonderland. There, there it is. That's what, like I said. Yeah, go on. You know, 
Yeah. Give me a second. I'm going to go pour myself a little vodka and we're going to come back and talk about this. <laughs> yeah, yeah we we missed, we're, we're definitely missing some mind altering. Wow. Forces. Wait, wait. So, Jana. We're, we're so, going to have our after party Zoom link. Uh, yeah. Wait, so, Jana, just to, to if, if I understand what you're saying, if all light beams go to the singularity, then all, all, all possible paths into your future as you fall in would go to that singularity because you can't take a path that's not the path that the light takes. That's right. right. So basically what it says is if I should, it it basically says if you're going slower than the speed of light, you are definitely going into that singularity because the only way you could not go into that singularity is if you went faster than the speed of light and you can't do that. Right. So so the technical language would be, just because it's sometimes poetic to hear it, it's not necessarily edifying, but it's poetic, is that he proved that all of the future light cones pointed towards a singularity. That wow. was what he showed. There's yeah. one figure in this paper in 1964 where he draws it all out. I'm telling you, it's just the most beautiful, it's all compact, it's all right there in this one picture where he just shows that this absolutely is inevitable that the black hole singularity forms and that it is in the future of any any path hmm. on the interior of the black hole. Yeah. All right. Uh, Go Chuck, Roger. keep it coming. <laughs> okay, all right. Uh, this is Izzy Rohr, it says, Hi, Neil, Chuck, Jana, it's Violetta, my mom, Izzy. I'm 12 years old from Birmingham, Alabama, and I love all things astrophysical. Uh, Professor Gez says that the data collected, which ultimately proved the existence of Sagittarius A, are consistent with Einstein's general theory of relativity, while absolutely 100% not consistent with Newton's law of gravity. And even then, she said that Einstein is right, at least for now. My questions are, how can something, a major thing like this in the cosmos, abide by general relativity and yet not follow one of the most basic and fundamental laws of physics? Does this mean we will need to discover a new law of gravity? And does this mean general relativity needs to be upgraded or expanded upon? P.S. Jana, you are the first woman astrophysicist I ever saw in an episode of Star Talk a few years back, and you have inspired me so much ever since. Thank you for rocking science so hard for girls and kids like me all over the cosmos. Go, Jana! Thank you! Go, Jana! Thank you. Uh, and, 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 and by the way, <laughs> but, none, of, mm-hmm. none of that question impressed me like the way the question began. Because mm-hmm. she mm-hmm. knew that the word data is plural. Plural. <laughs> <laughs> these data show yeah. what these data are. Yeah. So if you know that, you're, you're, you're yeah. ready for That's any half kind the of bottom. scientific <laughs> career. <laughs> um, well, I was so flattered and flushed that I forgot the question. Oh, but I think I got it. I think I got it. It's actually... Um, I think it's if, if it violates Newton's laws, how is that possible? If it Newton's laws apply across the universe, right. but it right. satisfies Einstein's laws. What's yeah. going on? So, so I, I liken it this way. Just because Newton's laws aren't all-encompassing doesn't mean the laws are, like, wrong. They're not dead wrong. And I sometimes, I sometimes try to explain it this way. If, uh, if, if you thought English was the only language in the universe, and then you discovered there was this broader concept called language, right. it wouldn't make English wrong, Right? English right. is still useful. It just has a limited range of validity. It doesn't help you with French or you know, Arabic or whatever other language. It turns out that there are extensions that's a much bigger umbrella, which is this concept of language. Right? So to a certain extent, in its limited range of, of validity, Newtonian physics is great. Works terrific. It just doesn't work everywhere all the time. It's just not. It's not big enough. It's not that it's wrong. It's just. It's just a subset of a larger concept. So the first thing that Einstein did when he was trying to um, test his own theory was exactly to make sure he he matched. He respected Newton. That he respected Newtonian dynam- dynamics in its range of validity, which would be. When you're not moving very quickly, when you're around big things like the Earth, when you're moving slowly, like it should look like Newton said it should. So, um, so it's not as though when I drop an apple, it no longer does what I used to think it does, just because of general relativity. Right. So, just so, so what you're also saying there is that um, if you take Einstein's equations and put in low gravity and low speeds, 
-hmm. they become Newton's equations. That's right. They become very close approximations to Newton's equations. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So exactly. they're still in the same sandbox. Or, or, yeah. or the wow. sandbox is bigger now. Yeah. yeah. The sandbox yeah. just got, I mean, Newton never considered, well, what happens if I crush the earth to a point? <laughs> <Stupid>. <laughs> or what happened what? if I was going near the speed of light? Yeah, they're stupid. <laughs> <laughs> and those were exactly the kind of thoughts, experiments, the kind of fantasies that led Einstein to realize that, oh, Newtonian mechanics would slowly look different than we presume. Mm -hmm. It is, and we would start to learn that there are generalizations that start to look very different in certain extreme circumstances. All right, Chuck, we only have like a couple of minutes left. Give me, okay. see if we can squeeze two in here. And, and Janet, soundbite answers. Okay, go. Okay. Yeah. All right, here we go. Cameron Bishop says, singularities or ringularities? I just got to know what we know about the geometry at the center of a black hole. Thanks. Yeah, what's a ringularity, Jana? Oh, in um, a spinning, black, spinning hole, black hole, it turns out that the singularity has a different geometry than it does in what Schwarzschild considered, which was just kind of a perfect implosion. Um, but I think that... Is, is it a donut? I, and wouldn't, wouldn't most black holes it, then it's, be spinning kind of black range. holes? Yes, most black holes are spinning black holes. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. <laughs> and, and when things collapse, just like a, an ice skater pulling in her arms, they tend to spin faster and faster. Um, so we do believe that black holes are likely spinning. Um, but, but most, to be honest, most astrophysicists and, and theoretical physicists believe that the singularity is, is where general relativity will break down, kind of connected to your previous question. We believe that there's another theory that will make us understand that singularities actually don't exist. And that they're signaling, they're telling us, this isn't working anymore. <laughs> Like, this is breaking down. As has been said, the singularities where God is dividing by zero. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Which is, not, that's a no-no. No, seriously, you're now going to have a cult. Like, <laughs> why did, you can't say stuff like that. You know, <laughs> no, it's going to be in QAnon. I mean, Q -Anon. it's going to be a big deal. <laughs> Come to where God divides by zero. On November 3rd, <laughs> no, yeah, that's so God funny. is dividing by zero. <laughs> All right, another one, quick, check. Give it to me. All right, very quickly. This is Sam Axe. Uh, Sam says this. If you were to throw in some anti, if you were to throw some antimatter into a black hole, would that shrink it or make it bigger? So a lot of people have a misconception that antimatter has negative energy or negative mass, but it doesn't. There's really not, to, to our knowledge, anything with negative mass. So if you have an electron, its antiparticle has opposite every other quantum number. For instance, if the electron's negatively charged, the positron's positively charged, but they both have the same mass. So mass and energy is what matters when it goes into a black hole. You might change the charge of the black hole, but you're just going to make its mass go up. I it's going to get heavier. Okay, so yeah, so antimatter is not some panacea for, for undoing the universe and the damage that gravity has done. Right. No. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I th guys, I think we got to call it quits there. We're out of time. Oh, man. man. Damn. Always yeah. so good. It's always that so good awesome. with Jan 11. Jenna, in the I, house. <laughs> Jenna, I have. I miss you guys. I hear rumors that you're working on another book. I just, uh, this is rumors. I'm just saying. I am. Just rumors, but okay. When the exciting. book comes out, can we bring it back? Yeah, Black Hole Survival Guide. Of survival. Oh, we need that. Well, we got to bring it back for that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Can we bring it back? I'd love that. Okay, we'll talk Always about your fun. book, and and we'll bring it back soon. I think your book is coming out uh, even just in a few weeks. Yeah. So, all right, Chuck. Always good to have you. Always a pleasure. Janet, we Let's, love you here at Star Talk, and thanks for always accepting our invitations. All right. Always. This has been Star Talk Cosmic Queries, the Black Hole Nobel Prize edition, of course, with Jan 11. I'm Neil deGrasse Tyson. If you're a personal astrophysicist, keep looking up. <laughs>